case we didn't mention it, ladies and gentlemen, this, this uh, event today is being streamed live across the state, and we're glad to have that. Uh, it's a little like dealing with the officials at a football game. This is a, a technical timeout for uh, TV purposes. But let, let me, uh, again, welcome you back uh, to what is going to be a very productive afternoon. And, and let me ask you to do a favor for me. I, I, I'm getting a lot of great comments from people in the room. Uh, what I want you to do is I want you to go talk to people that aren't here today and say, you missed a great conversation. You missed some important information. You need to engage. If you'll do that, that will help advance what we're doing. Um, I, you know, I get, uh, I travel a lot, and I travel a lot with the governor, and I get to do this fairly often. But I'm always, I'm becoming more and more aware, reluctantly, that the governor's term is eventually going to end, and maybe sooner than I'd like, to say the least. Um, and so when I think about how I introduce him, um, to be honest with you, it, it changes a little bit. I've known the governor for 37 years, 37 years. We've worked together, certainly in the legislature and out of the legislature, for 37 years. He served as my finance chairman when I was president of the Senate, and I'm now serving as his secretary of commerce as he serves his terms as governor. It has been a, a great relationship. We've uh, watched each other get married, have kids, uh, and I, I'm incredibly appreciative of his friendship. But, but I, I got to tell you, he has a really tough job. I, people kind of miss that. They're, everyone's always looking for what he's doing for them. The truth of the matter is, is he has a very, very tough job. And. Uh, I have a problem. <laughs> it'll, it'll wait. Governor Tomlin, I, I have never known anybody more passionate about the place he lives. We all have our homes across the state. Um, we all have loyalties to the local high school we graduated from and, and uh, the college we went to and all of those things. And I've, I've worked with those type of folks all my life. But, but I've, never, I've never worked with anybody more passionate about his home and his, the region in which he comes. I've never known anybody more embedded in the history and the culture of his home than Governor Tomlin. He has a really nice house on the river. It's very picturesque. And he doesn't miss an opportunity to come home to Chapmanville, to his house, to put his head on his bed in the community in which he loves. And so when this series of events started to occur in West Virginia, it really isn't surprising to me that one of the governor's most obvious characteristics kind of slipped by the way. Governor, all those of us who work with him know him to be very smart, very thoughtful, but also very methodical. He is, he makes sure that everything has been thought out in advance. Uh, he hasn't been methodical about what's happening in the southern coal fields of West Virginia. He has been passionate. He has been driven. He has driven others to react. And so today's event is really Governor Tomlin's event. And it's Governor Tomlin's event because as sad as I am about his term wrapping up, I know the governor is very much aware that his time is limited in this role and that if there's going to be a great success in southern West Virginia, it can't be all about him. And so that's why he's brought you all together. That's why he is driving this train. That's why he is he is soliciting and working on strategies. And that is why I am incredibly proud today to introduce the 35th governor of the state of West Virginia, Earl Ray Thomas.
Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very pleased to. Uh, I'm what? <laughs> oh, thank you very much. I forgot. I have a mic. <laughs> Thanks, Gary. Uh, well, I, I got so wrapped up in what Keith was saying here, I just got carried away there, but uh, it is uh, great to uh, see so many of you here today, and I want to thank uh, Keith for that very uh, kind introduction, and Keith, all that you and your team uh, do uh, for West Virginia, and, and what a great event that we've been having here. Uh, I, as I look around the room, I see so many uh, familiar faces, which is great, uh, not only the locals, uh, local officials, and so forth, but uh, folks from around the state who have come to... Uh, to participate today. Uh, we welcome you all uh, here today to uh, talk about the future of uh, Southern West Virginia. I've been told that this morning's uh, sessions were, were very good and uh, we certainly appreciate those participants also. Also, as I, I said, I want to uh, thank the West Virginia Department of Commerce for organizing this event, the Logan County Chamber of Commerce, and all of you today for making this roundtable discussion a great success. As governor and as the son of these southern coal fields, finding ways to strengthen our coal communities is a topic that, as Keith said, is, is very important to me. And I know it's equally important to each of you in this room and to our business and our families who have called this area home for many generations. Now, I know that times are tough now, but as we fight for coal jobs and continue our, to offer our support and retraining for our miners and families, we must also look toward our future and find ways to create opportunities for Southern West Virginia now and for many decades to come. We know there are challenges ahead, but I'm confident that together we can begin the productive conversations and develop a plan to revitalize Southern West Virginia. Today's panel discussions have been designed to inspire new ideas, and I hope that uh, you found our morning sessions helpful and informative. And I encourage you to stick around for this afternoon session, which I, I know will be great too, and stop by our, our, our exhibitor booths on the outside to learn more about numerous, numerous programs that are being discussed here today. As we work together to create a plan to revitalize Southern West Virginia, I'm glad to be here to talk more about the HOBET project that I announced during this year's State of the State Address. I'm passionate about this project because I believe it has real potential to define the future of this region of the state, putting hardworking West Virginians back to work, strengthening our local economies, and to serve as a model for familiar pro similar projects across the region. And today I've asked two familiar faces to join me to share more about this exciting project. First, I'm sure most of you in this room knows, if not all of you, Gary White who has years of experience with the coal industry and as interim president of Marshall University. He launched a partnership with WVU to engage our state's higher education community to bring this project, the HOBET project, to light. And Gary's with us today to share more details on their role. And also today with us is Tom Clark. And Tom and his team from the Virginia Conservation Legacy Fund, or if you want to shorten it, call it VCLF, Took me a few weeks to get those initials right, but VCLF is much easier to say. But they, uh, they are now continuing the mining operations at Hobet over near Danville and are working closely with the state and local landowners to come up with the best plan to develop this site. So gentlemen, I thank you for joining us for today's discussion and for your help in, on this very exciting project. As I mentioned earlier, Southern West Virginia is my home but it's home to many of you also. And today we're just gonna sit here and talk about the vision for the HOBET project and what it could mean to the people who call all these hills here home. We want to hear from you as well. So once the discussion portion of our keynote uh, wraps up, we're happy to answer any questions that any of you may have. So we'll get us started now and I'll kick it off by saying that 
you know, we've, I've stood at this podium in this beautiful facility here at Chief Logan State Park many times, and, and I'm sure that for those of you who, who it's your first time here, I'm sure you were probably surprised when you walked in and saw what a great facility this was. But what many of you may not know is this facility was built on a former mountaintop site. And it's one of those things that uh, there's been that discussion for years on, you know, what's going to happen after mining is gone and so forth. This is just one example of what you can do with level ground in, West, in, in southern West Virginia, is to build good facilities on it. Now, we've talked also about diversifying our economy for many years. Growing up here from the time I was a young boy, I saw the coal industry go up and the coal industry go down and up and down. And when the coal industry was up, everybody was had jobs, things were flourishing. You could hardly get on the streets in downtown Logan. But when things went down, we started to see our friends and our families leave the area, go to Detroit, go to Columbus, Cleveland, later in the 80s to Charlotte to find a way to take care of their families. But coal mining has always sprung back. But things are different this time. Um, I'm sure that coal is still going to continue to play a major role in our economy in West Virginia. And I will continue my support of miners and the coal industry like I always have. But there's been a change. It's not only been here in West Virginia or here in the United States, but around the world on the whole opinion of coal, as we all know. There'll still be a place for it. We'll still be mining coal and, and producing electricity, but maybe not to the levels we were eight or 10 years ago. So I think it's so important that we're here today to have this discussion, to be able to say, what are we going to do with Southern West Virginia? You know, we've been able to address our business climate in West Virginia. We have handled our workers' compensation problems. We've lowered taxes. We're competitive now. Only yesterday, or day before yesterday, days have kind of run together this week on me, but <clears throat> we announced the product, product line for Procter & Gamble, which was a huge uh, catch for West Virginia when we announced that we got that project last year. Yeah, it's going to employ hundreds, if not thousands, of people in the coming uh, year, months and years ahead as they go through both the construction and then permanently get the, the product lines open. We announced eight of the products that they will be producing here, multi-billion dollar products that will not only be going all across the country but around the world. So we are competitive and we're doing well. That's in the eastern panhandle. Our northern part of the state's doing well, our north central, because the, the exploration and the Marcellus Shell gases. We here in southern West Virginia, we've been confined to coal. And one of the reasons we have been, even though we've talked about diversifying the, our economy, for many years is because of the one thing that we lack in southern West Virginia. We've got great people, great workers, great skills, the lack of flat land. And for so many years we, we've talked about it, but that's been our biggest drawback. And Keith can tell you, in the development office, they're juggling at least a hundred potential investors at any given time trying to find the right kind of piece of land that they need. And it's not only here in, in Logan, Mingo, Boone, Lincoln, Wyoming counties, it's in Kanawha County. If you think about it, if you drive through, you don't find vast amounts of level ground to be able to build things. And so, you know, over the years, early in my time of being governor, I, people would ask me what I'd like to do. I said, I'd like to ride four-wheelers. Well, I still like to ride four-wheelers. Don't get to do it much anymore, but it used to be up until about five years ago. On Sundays, there would be a group of us to go ride four-wheelers. And we'd go from Logan County into Lincoln County and get on top of the mountain and see, as, almost as far as you could see, was basically level ground. It was ground at Hobet Mining over near Danville, right on Quarter G. And I would you know, sit there and think, my goodness, how could we utilize this ground to get investment in southern West Virginia? And, of course, the mining was still going on, so there's not a lot you can do. But now, after 30 years of Hobet operating, they've employed hundreds and hundreds of people there over the years, produced millions of tons of coal. The mining is coming to an end. And finally, about last May, June, July, you know, we got a visit from, the, from Patriot officials who were saying they're winding down the operation over there. And I said, that's sad. I hate to hear that. But on the bright side, 
what are you going to do with that property? <laughs> um, and, and the conversation began there and about, you know, that the, the, they're still in the process of doing the reclamation and so forth. Some of it's already been reclaimed. But if you don't have an alternative plan, what you've got to do after you mine coal is to return the property to the approximate original contour. And that's what's happened to a lot of the property over there. But even though it's been put, we've put mountains back up, they're easy to level out and make flat and make usable again. And, I, and, and so that's what I had in mind. So after uh, Patriot filed their bankruptcy, that kind of delayed us a while. We didn't know what was going to happen there. But at the end of that procedure, when it came out, and we kind of put the holds on my thoughts about the property, then, then came the, 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 this new group of people that I'd never heard of before, the Virginia Conservation Legacy Fund. And that's where Tom Clark and, and Ken McCoy, who is also a major player in this, who, who sorry he couldn't be here today, but he's also from Man, West Virginia. And those, those two are the key players. And we sat down with them, and they basically said, Governor, whatever we can do to work with you to, to use this property for industry and to create jobs in West Virginia, we're here to help you. And, and obviously, with that said, and they got control of the vast uh, majority of all that property over there. That, that was music to buy ear. So anyhow, we've been working diligently with uh, uh, VCLF over the past several months. We've been meeting weekly for the past six months or so <coughs> with most of my administration and Gary and others, my Secretary of Commerce, my Secretary of DEP, my Secretary of Transportation, and, and members of my uh, uh, inner staff at the, at the Governor's Office. I'm trying to figure out what we've got to do to get this thing up and going, and knowing all at the same time that the clock is ticking on my term. And it's one of those things, as I said in the beginning, I got a passion about this project. And so we have continued to work. We recently met with all the property owners there. Many of them have already agreed to donate or give their or work with us toward conveying that property to West Virginia. Now just, you know, and, and I know that you know, we're from different counties down here, but we gotta forget the county lines. But what the good things about this piece of property is, several things. First of all, the whole mining site's about 25,000 acres. About 12,000 of it has been mined or still at one end of it in, 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 in the process of being mined or, or reclaimed. Now, if you talk about basically level ground, 12,000 acres, imagine how much that is. Just to put things in perspective, 12,000 acres basically covers the whole city of Huntington. If you just imagine that without any buildings or houses on that's how big of a piece of property we're talking about. We're talking about it's right on quarter G, which is quickly becoming a major north-south thoroughfare. We're talking about railroad transportation. We're talking about a half hour from Charleston and from, from Yeager Airport. We're talking about water and sewer that we'd have to get up the hill. And, and you know, and, and if you look at a workforce, within an hour or less drives, over 300,000 people <coughs> in that circle around it to draw from. So those are the kind of things that, that businesses look for, you know, is, is access, you know, uh, to, to the infrastructure that's, uh, that's out there, access to a, a good workforce. See Kathy D'Antoni here, who's doing a great job, along with uh, Sarah Tucker, from our community colleges. We've got Southern Community College right in Danville over there, who could walk into a plant, train the people for them. So it's got so much potential out there that I think that uh, you know, it, it's one of those things that it will not happen while I'm governor. But if we can plant the seed, if we can get the ball rolling, in the next nine months, and I feel confident we can. Our Department of Transportation is already looking at the way to get a, an industrial type road up there that beats the, the, the curvature level as well as the uh, incline to be able to put a real industrial type uh, road up there. <coughs> Excuse me, we can at the same time get all the infrastructure there. We're working with WVU and Marshall, which Gary will talk about to be able to do the land, plan, uh, land use plan up there. And any business that would come to Keith or any of the rest of the economic development folks in the room, 
we can say that we've got an acre of land for you, or we got 50 acres of land, we got 150 acres of land or 500 acres. What do you need? We can have it for you. We can get her prepped for you and ready to go. We got people like Kathy D'Antoni in our community college system who can start training your, your employees for you right now. You know, we'll, we'll have the things that you need uh, through our development office to be able to give you the help you need to make sure that you're successful in West Virginia and down the road. We'll have our Southern West Virginians working at good paying jobs with good benefits on the top of Hope at uh, Mine site over near Danville. So anyhow, that's my dream and that's my vision. And I think we can get it done. Once again, we'll get the seed planted. We may even have growth about this high by the time I leave office next January. But it will be one that for the next 25 or 50 years in Southern West Virginia will make a true difference in the, in the Southwest corner of West Virginia. So with that, I'll recognize my good friend, Gary White, for his portion. Okay. Thank you, Governor. Uh, I was thinking as I was driving up to this site uh, this morning that I got a call from the governor when he was finance chair, Keith, and uh, he said, you know, I've got this vision for a potential convention center uh, on the site. This is a former Pittston uh, surface mine, and uh, we need some site work done. And immediately we pulled together three of the operators, one major corporation, two independent companies. We sit and sent men and equipment here and prepared this site, and we're all enjoying the benefit of that as we, as we meet here today. And I think that's an example of what our governor has brought to the table in a much, much larger scale. If you listen to the current political rhetoric at the national level, and I try not to listen to it, and you probably do too, but you can't escape it. One of the things that frankly is offensive to me, when national candidates talk about the coal fields in West Virginia, they spend their time talking about making sure that our, that our people get their benefits, making sure that they're protected in this time of need. I'm 66 years old, was born in Logan. I think I know these people pretty well. Our people don't want welfare. They want to go to work. We've got to have jobs for our people. And frankly, I'm offended when I hear that. But with the leadership of Governor Tomlin, I got the call back about April or May of last year, just about this time, talking about this, this opportunity. And I've been involved in economic development in Southern West Virginia most of my working career in one form or the other. And we never had a highway system. We never had water and sewer facilities available. We never had any flat land to offer. What were we going to do? Well, here we are today and we have that. And the Hobet site, as the governor has said, is about 12,000 acres as it sits right now, just off the corridor. What a tremendous opportunity. And due to the untimely death of Dr. Stephen Kopp, a very, very dear friend of mine, who was president of Marshall University, I was asked to come to Marshall as interim president and was pleased to serve there until January the 15th of this year, so a little bit more than, a couple of weeks more than one year. And during that time, we were able to pull together the resources of Marshall University, who, by the way, over those 30 years, had done a lot of work, consulting and engineering type work, on this Hobet site. So the folks at Marshall were very familiar with the site. We got them involved and they continue to be involved in helping us along with the development office and the governor's office decide how the appropriate use of that land, land use planning. We engaged Dr. Gee. Uh, Dr. Gee and I go back about 30 years with a personal relationship that has a common denominator by the name of Buck Harless. 
And Dr. Gee and I got together and we brought the uh, expertise of WVU into the picture to look at doing the market research. Okay, we've got the property. Hopefully we'll have the infrastructure in place. Where you hunt ducks where ducks are. Help us decide what type of prospects are out there that this property would be very attractive for. And they are engaged in that. One of the interesting exercises, I don't think, I think the governor, governor made a good example of the size of this property. But I'm going to give you another one. Because you just can't comprehend the size of this developable property that is available to us. At Marshall, we have a, a program, a virtualization program, where in our engineering department, we can take, Tom, the, the surface mine permit maps from that property and put that data into this program, and it will create a virtual picture of that surface. And then you can put trees, and you can put roads, and you can put buildings, and you can literally create a virtualization that our development office will be using, by the way, as they market this property. But one of the interesting things that our folks did very early on in this process, and they did this on their own, they were just curious. They took every major economic development project that has come to, tw to West Virginia in the last 20 years and placed that in that virtualization program on that property. You can barely find it. Toyota, Procter & Gamble, the list goes on and on. Every major, they even put Gestamp on there, the Charleston Project. It, it's, it's almost uh, unbelievable, the opportunity that's available. The governor is making a major financial commitment to make this work. Marshall University is making a major commitment to help develop. I've volunteered my time and will continue. Been in this industry about 45 years, sort of know my way around and particularly know my way around southern West Virginia. But this is the most exciting thing that we have seen in terms of taking southern West Virginia to the next level. We have a great workforce. We have a network of very successful independent businesses in southern West Virginia that are here because they grew up in the coal industry. They serve the coal industry. they are hydraulic shops and electric motor shops and other businesses that frankly are struggling right now because of the coal industry being where it is. We need to take that resource and redeploy it so that they can continue to serve the coal industry as it starts to come back. And I agree with the governor, it will be coming back to some extent. Not what we're used to in the past, but there will be a coal industry here. But let's help those businesses survive so that they're here to serve uh, the new businesses that our Department of Commerce is going to bring. So it's a, it's a tremendous opportunity. It's an unprecedented opportunity. And thanks to the Sunday four-wheeler trips, four -wheeler trips <coughs> with the governor and, and, uh, and some of his friends, uh, a vision. You know, I'm, I'm like uh, uh, our friend from the uh, uh, Appalachian Regional Commission. I'm the son of a minister, most of you know. And, uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll close with a little quote. If you, where there is no vision, the people perish. And we've got a vision here, and we've got leadership. Unfortunately, we have to assume we've got a very short period of time. So a lot of things have to be done very quickly, and we're committed at Marshall University. West Virginia, is commit, West Virginia University is committed, and we ask for your support to get this, to take this thing from a concept to reality, and it can be done. It can be done in such a way that regardless of the leadership of this state going forward, it will be such an attractive opportunity that, that they will be compelled to continue uh, that development and continue the, division, the vision that Governor Tomlin has brought. So uh, 
I'm excited to be involved, and uh, uh, I really think this is uh, this will go down in history as being uh, the major development that will that will redevelop and redeploy uh, the workforce in Southern West Virginia for the future. So, uh, and and let me just say that uh, Tom Clark and VCLF uh, have brought a new vision uh, to what we would consider uh, the post-mining land use of our land. And they've stepped up to the plate when others have stepped away from the challenge. And when I got a call from Ken McCoy, who actually worked for me as my safety director at Amherst Coal Company about 40 years ago. And when Ken was involved, I didn't know Tom Clark, but when Ken called and said he was involved and there was a new idea, it got my attention, and the more I've learned about it, the more I'm convinced that, that Tom, you and, and your vision for what this can be is, uh, is truly a blessing to Southern West Virginia. And as, uh, Governor, I know you will agree, is a very important part of this, uh, uh, of this project going forward. Great, Tom. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Well, I... I don't want to disappoint the governor. He said he just got that acronym down, VCLF. I was actually thinking of changing the name to West Virginia Conservation <laughs> Legacy Fund. <laughs> but speaking of Virginia, which I do live in Virginia, but I very much believe and feel like I'm a West Virginian, um, there is a difference between the two states. Uh, we do a lot of conservation work in Virginia, Natural Bridge of Virginia, a lot of other programs. And I remember a new governor came in, and we were sitting down, and we were talking about, okay, what kind of conservation programs do we want to accomplish in Virginia? And I remember the one requirement was, anything we do will have to be finished in my four-year term. And so think about that. We have a governor that is at the end of his term, but deeply, deeply passionate about making this project happen, although it won't happen on his watch. And I think we all just need to take advantage of that and just really rally behind this project and make it all come together. Um, just a couple of thoughts that I want to share. Um, you know, we, we operate mines. We, we have the mine in uh, the Pinnacle Mine. That's in Wyoming County. It goes down into McDowell County underground. You know, we have here in Logan County, Hobet. Um, we do have mines up north, the Federal Mine. Um, you know, I've got to tell you, we, we, we've got maybe a thousand people that those jobs wouldn't be here. The Pinnacle Mine and its sister mine in Alabama were being harvested out. They were being shut down. Um, it definitely is a, a very, very difficult time. Uh, the gentleman that talked about laying it awake at night and worrying about payrolls. I mean, anybody in the mining industry is there. Um, I do think, though, that, that we have some opportunities here that maybe we haven't thought about. Um, I know it's sad to think about retiring mines, but that's just the reality of what's happening in the United States. Um, it's not just here, it's in the Illinois Basin, even out in the Powder River Basin, they just announced layoffs and reductions. Um, you know, we're not going to have a billion tons of coal anymore. As a matter of fact, it's very rapidly declining. It may actually be in the low 700 millions even this year. Um, but that's an opportunity. We've got a lot of reclamation work that has to be done. And if you think about the reclamation work just in this part uh, of West Virginia, you know, that's, that's a very long-term project. I mean, you know, that could be 10 years, 15 years. And it could be hundreds of people that aren't working today that can actually be a part of that transition. Um, so I think, you know, that's something we can be somewhat encouraged about. I guess I would almost call it a restoration economy. We're restoring the environment. Um, you know, things I heard this morning that were very encouraging is, is, you know, the work that's being done with the next generation in the technical schools, the work that's being done at the community college. I mean, I truly do believe that we have a workforce that's going to be prepared, that's going to be ready, and that's going to be able. Um, you know, but that has to be balanced with, you know, sites. We have to have places to do things, and it has to be balanced with being an attractive candidate to outside parties. And, and I guess I've just been so pleased with this project. Um, it, it, it's not just VCLF. I mean, there's multiple landowners 
and almost every single one of them has come together and said, we want to be a part of this solution. We want to help. We want to volunteer, you know, our property to this. Um, and, and that really, I think, sort of, you know, goes back to, you know, the difference in West Virginia. I mean, we're a community state. I mean, you know, we help each other. We, we come together in times of need and we support each other. Um, and employers appreciate that. That doesn't happen everywhere in the country, I, I can assure you. And so I, I think we really can coalesce around this project, integrating, you know, the academic systems, integrating community development. Um, I love the things that I heard about. Let's not be competitive. Let's, let's not have 50 million of grant money and have 50 different organizations in, in, in Southern West Virginia, you know, compete for that. Let's all rally around these kind of projects together. Um, you know, we're just, we're just excited to be a part of it and uh, honored to, uh, to be able to contribute. Uh, thank you, uh, Tom and Gary, and uh, we're now, uh, would take any questions any of you may have. Tom? Governor, I'm excited you got your, your four-wheeling. <laughs> and, and Gary, as I listened to uh, you talk about this as uh, the assets that we have now that we didn't have when right. we were growing up in Logan County, that just gives me a whole new sense of excitement. Uh, Jenny, one of our panelists earlier, talked about missing pieces. So I wonder if you might comment, as you, to the extent you can, uh, what's, what may be the challenges that lie ahead, and how can we and uh, those of us across the state best help uh, put the pieces in place for this vision to become reality? Well, I, obviously, you know, your support, your uh, you know, the, the positive support you know, from a group like this, uh, you know, especially the residents of, of uh, Southern West Virginia. You know, I've uh, been able to discuss this with uh, many people, and I think for those people who know what's been going on and the progress we've been able to make up to this time are very excited about the potential. You know, we're uh, a little different maybe, from, uh, Tom, than others around the country that, you know, that we're family, we're friends, we're you know, cousins and everybody else, but yeah, this is where people grew up, and they hate to leave. Uh, I don't know of anybody that really wants to leave, but obviously, if you don't have a job, you can't support your family, you leave. So, you know, I would just uh, ask that, you know, as we go forward with this, we'll be calling on different ones of you to, uh, to uh, support us, to help us, and, and uh, you know, be able to uh, uh, make this thing become a reality. As I said, it's going to take a few years. Uh, Gary and I have also talked about things. You know, we've got a lot of people from all over West Virginia who've been hugely successful nationally. And everyone we've talked to over the years, and Tom, you know many of those people, you know, they still have a fond place in their heart for West Virginia where they got started, where they grew up, and so forth, about trying to get to, uh, put together a piece of, uh, or a group of those type people who can, because of, of their connections or because of their positions with national and international companies, be able to help us very quickly get people, because of the influence they would have, to say, we'll make a commitment to putting a plant in, in southern West Virginia. We can probably create four or 500 jobs for you, but you know, those are the kind of decision makers we have. They decide where plants are built, you know, and, and, and what products are, are to be used. So, you know, that's one of those things that Gary and I have started to work on, you know, and, and would invite any of you here who got connection with those people. So we have one friend. Even, even just the names. I mean, uh, uh, Ann Barth has uh, uh, the, the chairman CEO of Intuit, who is from Cerrito Canova, coming to Charleston next week. And we're gonna be having a conversation with him. And that's just one of many examples. Uh, in fact, uh, just to make the point, uh, Joanne and I were seated at the table with him when he was honored that's, for a large- That's Gary's Joanne. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll have to watch that, don't we? Uh, <laughs> Uh, Joanne and I were seated at the table with Brad Smith and his wife, and seated next to us was a guy from Clay County who happens to be the CEO of NetJets, with airplanes flying all, literally all over the world. He's from Clay County. I mean, let's think about who these people are and bring that list of people together, and I think some things can happen. I think the other thing I would say is it's 
the time between now and the end of Governor Tomlin's uh, term is critical to get a commitment and actually get some dirt moving on the infrastructure that's necessary to make this work. We have to have an interchange, a major bridge. We've got to bring water and sewer and broadband up onto the Hobet site. If we can get that commitment, if we can get, pardon the pun, if we can get that in concrete, then it's going to be very difficult for those in the future. We also have a window of opportunity that's, a, that's pretty narrow. Tom and his company are there doing work. They have men and equipment. We can utilize, they have volunteered their men and their equipment to do site prep and do the kinds of things that would cost millions of dollars if you had to deploy, redeploy equipment and people up there to do it. So we've got a lot of things to get done in a very, very short period of time. Just let me add one more thing to that is, uh, you know, while we, and Chief, y'all may have discussed it earlier today, but especially for our workforce here, you know, I don't care what it is, if, you, if you're learning, you're advancing yourself out there. But we have millions of dollars because of the downturn of the economy here and so forth to do training, not only for coal miners themselves, but for their, their spouses, their kids, their families, if they have been displaced in any way by, by the loss in, in, in coal jobs. And there's several different programs. We've got Russ Fry from uh, Workforce West Virginia, who's here with us now today. But to get people, you know, while they're not working, get them involved with some kind of a training program, you know, whether it be basic education or mathematics or something that's generally accepted to, to help you make a better employee when, when, the, when the time comes. And, I mean, this is a free education, basically, that you can get. And, and if, if you're as a minor or a minor's spouse, if you don't want to do it, at least get your kids in there to get what training you can. I mean, you know, we're so fortunate to have Southern West Virginia Community and Technical College in, in uh, Mingo, Logan, Lincoln, Boone, Wyoming counties that, that are offering classes there. And it, you know, you don't have to complete a degree in four years, but if you can go ahead and get 12 or 15 or 30 hours in, that's that much behind you when the time comes when you may need that additional training or, or different skills to get into one of these new jobs. So you can't wait until they're, they're hiring people tomorrow to say, boy, I wish I got that training I needed three years ago or two years ago. Let's try to encourage our people to get as much education as they can right now. Yes, sir. Revitalizing Southern West Virginia and creating jobs. Uh, my question to you is, in an environment, political environment, where it seems that partisan politics sometimes bring to halt good initiatives, good projects, how do you plan to ensure that the seeds that you're planting now, the motivation that you're, that you're creating now in revitalizing Southern West Virginia is maintained beyond your tenure, um, regardless of whether we have a, a governor from the southern part of the state or regardless of the political affiliation of the, the future governor? I would certainly hope that we will have contracts in place to be able to start moving forward fairly quickly. We'll have interagency inter agreements in place that will continue to long after I'm gone to be able to assure that this, uh, this process does to, uh, continue to go on after my administration's over. You know, we're, <clears throat> a lot of people think maybe that Southern West Virginia is dead. We're not dead in southern West Virginia. We still got a huge population down here, you know, and very active people politically. And so I think that you know, whoever my successor may be, you know, especially if we got the contracts and are starting with the infrastructure and getting the preparations made for business to move in, it would be very tough for them to say, we're going to cut southern West Virginia off. I look around this room, I see a whole lot of political support. <laughs> but anyhow, that's one. And, and you know, I, I think that. Yeah, most people, uh, like probably all people running for governor or if you're going to be in that position, know that we as a state, we all kind of like the ships, we rise and fall together. And just as this part of the state has, has carried this state for the last 75 or 100 years with the, the taxes from coal mining and, and uh, personal income tax and consumer sales tax, 
And if you look over in Eastern Panhandle, it's doing great right now. Huge influx of people in the last 10 to 15 years. 25 years ago, there was not a third amount of people that there is over there now. If you looked at Northern Panhandle, when the steel mills went out of business, it became very poor. At the same time, during all these things, Southern West Virginia was pumping money in. <clears throat> you cannot let Southern West Virginia sit here and die. It's got to be an active participant. It's got to have people working and contributing to the common good of the state of West Virginia. And any governor should recognize that. And we've made investments in other part of the state. We're still helping, as I mentioned earlier, with Procter & Gamble, Macy's. We're right now in the process of putting a, a, a brand new 10-inch uh, line into to Berkeley and Jefferson counties because they're gassed down over there. As much as we're producing, we can't deliver it, and we've lost some plants. That's where they want to locate, but they didn't have the natural resources to do it. So as governor, it's, it's important for me that I get that infrastructure in place to make sure that we can continue to create jobs and, and a good economy in the eastern panhandle, just as some other governor may say, we need to do what we can for southern West Virginia to make sure that it's prosperous and continues to pull its weight. I think we'll, we'll be fine. Governor, I think uh, something that, that came to mind that, that I'd like Tom to talk about, you know, you and I have talked about, we don't hear a lot of conversation about this, but, but Tom Haywood would agree, if the natural gas economy was where it should be, if gas was at $4 or $4.50 per decatherm, then the next natural gas frontier is southern West Virginia. We have four deep formations here that have not been explored. So we have a future in natural gas here, but believe it or not, as we said, we still have a future in coal. Right here where we're located, we still have abundance an abundance of metallurgical quality coal. And there's going to be a demand for that as long as steel is being made. But also, I, I'd like you to hear Tom's vision of how his company plans to take what they're doing in reclamation and in effect make steam coal from southern West Virginia more competitive in the marketplace than it would otherwise be. And their success at that will mean that we will have coal production from southern West Virginia into the future in significantly greater quantities than we would otherwise have. Tom? Yeah, no, absolutely. And you know, I think one of the concerns whenever you develop um, a concept, an industrial park, uh, a development park, okay, now you've got to go get people to come into that and you're competing with communities across the country. Um, so we've really been focusing on what can we do to actually create our own you know, economic development, our own workforce. Um, and, and a couple of things, as Gary mentioned, um, you know, there, there, there is a focus, and you know, we, we, we don't have to debate it here, certainly, and I'm not going to talk about climate change, but uh, you know, there's a focus on carbon dioxide. So um, to the extent we can make thermal coal cleaner, um, you know, we've got an opportunity to actually be able to sell uh, more coal out of West Virginia. And, and the way to do that is really offsetting the carbon dioxide emissions. And we've been doing that through reforestation. Uh, we've got about a million carbon credits we created in a Central American project, about 12 million with a partner we created in the Mississippi Alluvial Delta. And we've actually been offsetting a lot of our shipments of, well, all of our shipments of thermal and metallurgical coal. But there's uh, the possibility in West Virginia now that we can um, you know, have that embedded in the cost of the utility. It's a very, very small cost, actually. Um, and then that can make West Virginia coal more competitive, certainly with people that burn it here, the five coal-burning power stations in West Virginia. So our hope is they only buy about, I think, 65% of their coal out of West Virginia. Can you believe that? People are burning coal in West Virginia, but buying it from, where would they buy it from? Who's got coal besides us as good as we do? But uh, the goal is that that would go closer to 100%, so we can sell more thermal coal. The MET coal, uh, I, I, I've spent uh, two, three weeks over the last two months in Europe trying to sell West Virginia metallurgical coal. And, you know, there's, there's people that know our coal seams, you know, by, uh, by, you know, the, by the seam and by the county. And I've been talking to the largest producer, uh, Ilva, which is an Italian steel maker. And 
They're like, yeah, we used to have mines in Logan County years ago. So, you know, we, we still have something that we can promote around South America and Europe as an export product. And then, you know, there's just other things that we should be thinking about here. The largest coal company in the world is also the largest renewable energy company, and that's Coal India. And they've got wind power across India. I mean, is it windy here in uh, southern West Virginia? It was last night. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, it's 17.1% it's of our power in the U.S. now, renewables are, and that number's just going to grow. So, you know, we need to think about that. And I know it can be controversial, wind turbines on mountains, but it puts a lot of people to work, construction and everything. So, and gas, natural gas, I mean, that's just a natural right. here. But, and uh, when gas is $4.50, a decatherm, then coal is competitive in uh, generating electricity. I guess, Tom, the other thing that's significant is the governor this week signed the legislation that gives the Public Service Commission the language that they need to provide for carbon credits within the rate base for the utilities in West Virginia. Heretofore, that didn't exist. Tom brought that to the attention of the governor. The legislation was offered and passed. and so. We're setting ourselves up to make our, our coal more competitive in the marketplace with the reclamation work that Tom's doing, the replanting of trees and the carbon credits that that generates, then that credit can be applied to the per ton cost of coal and make our coal more competitive. Of course, all those trees have to be planted here in West Virginia, too. Absolutely. <laughs> Further questions? Comments? Governor, I know that any project like Hobet is really big and it takes everyone getting behind it. So I just wanted to ask, you know, sometimes we uh, go against the grain here in West Virginia and we can do a little better job of working together when it's in our best interest. So just ask if you want to speak a little bit to the federal state partnership that's looking into this and what will come of that with uh, cooperation and unity. Absolutely. We've. Uh, been working. Um, obviously, uh, we, we get a little trickle of money down from D.C. occasionally, but uh, you know, a couple of different projects we've worked on. One was uh, one dealing, uh, and, and to be quite honest, I was very disappointed in it, but it was about a uh, $140 million grant that we had uh, looked at uh, and applied for, uh, and as it was our understanding, it was supposed to be to, to reinvigorate and, and help uh, uh, Coal communities uh, uh, across West Virginia. Obviously, we were not selected for that, and some of the uh, winners of that uh, 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 pot of money was is about a billion dollars they gave away, went to green spaces in California and different things, and zero to coal uh, states. But anyhow, we're over that. We'll move on to the next step. <laughs> he wasn't very pleased, and I let the president know I was not very pleased with it, but. At the, at the same time, I think you know, there, there's still a lot of money with ARC here today. Uh, we've had the uh, folks, uh, Jim and, and Earl Gould, uh, uh, co-chair co of uh, ARC, on the Hobet side over there. I think they were pretty impressed with what they, uh, they saw. Obviously, there's, uh, they have some money, I think, that we'll be asking them for to be able to assist us. Obviously, it's, as Gary said, this, this project's going to be a a heavy investment for the state of West Virginia, but I think that you know, we've been able to find the ways to get the, the main thing that I think the state is responsible for, and that's infrastructure to the site, and then obviously it's up to the development offers, office and others to get the, 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 the land shaped the way it needs to be, and thanks to, uh, to Tom and his people, we've got that uh, generally uh, outlined of what we're going to do. But I think that you know, we, we will have uh, a lot of uh, federal participation. I have involved both our United States Senators and, and Congressman Jenkins. They know, they and their staffs are very much aware of what we're doing, working with my staff, Brittany and, and uh, Robbie Queen, uh, been working out of my office on this. So they are uh, very excited about it. Uh, so it's, uh, I think it's very important that our federal and state and local, all of our local, our county and, and city people, I'll get involved and, and get behind this project because I think it's a very narrow window of opportunity that we've got and I think that you know we don't have time for a lot of distractions but if we can get together you know if you truly believe in this you know and, and all, all work together 
that we could have it, if we could have it in concrete, where we know that this will, will go on long after many of us are gone from office. That's, well, according, according to Emily, it looks like the time is up. <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyhow, I appreciate uh, uh, Tom and, and Gary for being on the uh, panel with me today. Keith, uh, thank you and, and your team for a great job and for everybody for attending today. We appreciate you being here. Ladies and gentlemen, th please thank Governor of the State of West Virginia, Gary White and Tom Clark.